Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. It is another episode of Between the Ears here on Mountaineers Now, a Sports Illustrated Fan Nation channel. Skylar Callahan here with you, along with Christopher Hall. We're four practices in to fall camp, West Virginia football, year five of Neil Brown. And we've got a little bit to talk about, I guess. There, there's not a whole lot really going on right now. It's, it's just really shells uh, and shorts at the moment. We're going to get into padded practices here very soon. So once that starts to come around, then we can kind of get a real evaluation, not only from our own eyes, but from the head coach's eyes as well. But uh, first off, let's just go ahead and start with the quarterbacks. Let's just go ahead and get the monkey uh, – or not the monkey, the elephant in the room out of the way. Uh, Garrett Green, Nico Markiel, they're going to be battling for this starting job. Uh, Neil Brown has, has talked at, at length that they are going to basically just let these two guys go, and until someone separates themselves, so, uh, that's basically how this competition is going to go. They're not going to just uh, award it after the first week or so. So if you're expecting that to happen, uh, you, sorry to, to tell you that that's not going to be the case. So – Chris, he's talked about the maturity level and the growth from both Nico and Garrett in terms of, I guess, how they handle the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of just practice, weight room, all that stuff. What do you think is going to be the, the, the ultimate deciding factor other than, I mean, obviously throwing picks and stuff, decision-making, what's something that you think will end up following this race? Uh, whoever the team gravitates to, uh, ultimately, um, and now that, that'll kind of go with making plays in practice. So, I mean, it's all kind of connected, but, you know, if you kind of look at it outside, you know, the outside in, you know, it seems like the team has surrounded themselves around Garrett. I mean, this is his fourth season in the program. He's been around. He, he understands what's expected of him. So, you know, I, I don't think that's a shocking statement at all that right now it's Garrett's team. Um, we'll have to see how it shakes out in practice. Just the few reps they've been doing, they've, you know, they've switched out from ones and twos. Um, everyone's kind of been playing with each other there in the top two, the top, when you're thinking about the two deep, uh, it's been kind of interchangeable. Only thing that really hasn't changed um, when you're talking about wholesale changes, offensive line, they, they only plug uh, maybe one or two uh guys from the two deep even three deep in that top line when you're talking about you know wherever Zach Frazier is that's that's your guy <laughs> that's that, that those are your ones so um they've kind of intermixed that a little bit but um you know when you really look at them um you know these thud practices they're lining up against each other I, I think what you notice more really with the quarterbacks and drills is they've gotten consistent with drills and I understand that they're just drills and it's not game environment, but they do kind of replicate it. Uh, just rolling out, hitting the net. Uh, they've got more. They've gotten consistent. They're more accurate, especially Garrett Green, and, and that stuff does translate in the games. I see it all the time with the running backs and Chad Scott when they do what their coach to do on those drills. You'll you actually see them in warmups right off the bat. That little jump cut they they use um, when they when they put that into play uh, in game action. You see those big runs. So. Seeing stuff like that is, you know, does bode well moving forward. If you're doing it, if you're doing it consistently in drills, it becomes uh, muscle memory, and you just do it in a game. So, be interesting to see how it works in live action against some of the DBs. Seeing some of the passing game uh, in scrimmage, it's, you know, it's very vanilla, very basic right now. But they're hitting the throws. The receivers are catching the ball. Haven't seen any drops. I'm not saying it hasn't happened. There's just a lot going on out there, but uh, that was something we noticed really quick early was drop passes last year, especially just on something as simple as a tunnel screen. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of that. I haven't really seen any drop passes. So right now through four, four, through four practices, uh, I'd say they're on the right path. Everything looks good right now, um, better than it did it has in previous seasons. So timeline, I mean – Personally, I think they're going to name a starting quarterback before the season. Like, I, I don't think they're going to go into Happy Valley without it being named. I think we'll probably see that happen, I don't know, say the last week of August maybe. Do you think 
Uh, probably the coaches show. It'll be the coaches. They'll hold on. They'll hold on to that information until well, probably the Neil Brown's radio show the week before. That's right. <laughs> it's usually when it gets announced. So. Is do you think that they will actually announce the starter before the game starts, or do you think we'll just know when whoever it is trots out on the field? I mean, they may wait that long. Uh, I doubt it. Um, you know, Neil, Neil's aware that people want to know going into the game. Penn State, you know, you, you can announce Garrett or Nico as a starting quarterback. There's not that much film on them, and they already know what to expect. So you're not really holding your cards. Um, they may just do it because Neil Brown's all about that kind of gamesmanship. So there yeah. is a little fun in that, but I think they'll know. You know, they're lining up in pads Monday. Um, I think through the first week, they'll have a good idea who's going to be a starter. I, and I wouldn't necessarily say if, you know, if they're kind of – not real sure. Um, could be a good thing. That means Nico's taking good uh, some steps as well because Garrett Green has really developed uh, since his time here. He was really far behind the rest of his freshman class, and he's come a long way. So Nico's not there yet. He doesn't have that confidence. He's still thinking maybe a little too much. Um, so it, it's not a bad thing, but I really think it, it's Garrett's team um, unless something happens drastically. Uh, They'll probably, like I said, they'll probably know about the end of this week. We may not hear it till that last Thursday before game day. Yeah, uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on uh, was the the impact of the transfers. Neil talked about it at length uh, during his press conference. I believe it was after the first day of camp, maybe. Um, yeah, first day of camp. He talked about that how they need guys like Tyron Bradley the Abilene Christian transfer to step up and really push Jared Bartlett at Bandit. They need Anthony Wilson at, at, in the safety room. They need EJ Horton, Noah Massey, Devin Carter at wide receiver. They need Fatoma Mulba and all these other guys on the, in that front seven uh, to really step up and, and take on big roles and almost from the get-go. And, and we, I think we mentioned it maybe last week that this was obvious because of what returns from last year's team and – the level of production that you got out of those guys. But is there one or two guys that just – they absolutely have to be a key factor, either side of the ball, that, that just sticks out to you and you're like, yes, this guy definitely has to be that guy. I think, you know, so much of this, you know, defense wins championships. And, I, you know, that one bad year was an anomaly. I'm not saying they're going to make leaps and bounds. But when you really look at it, you need someone from the receiving core step up, whether it's Devin Carter, uh, Deshaun Polk, uh, which he was just nominated for the Paul Horning Award for um, all-around total yards. I think Tavon Olsen was one of the first players uh, in college football history to actually win that award. So it's prestigious for Christian Matt McCaffrey uh, obviously won it. So – I think when you when you look at those group of receivers, um, Cortez Braham that came in last year, you got to get guys to step up, and that is the biggest area where I think the biggest needs were in this offense. So you got to find production, whether it's Devin Carter or Pope, EJ Horton. I know has been um, mentioned multiple times. So one of those guys have got to come in. I think those transfer are really important because you. I think you're you're going to need more than one. Um, just can't just have just one receiver putting up production. You need someone right behind that one uh, kind of chasing to make that safety look both ways, make those safeties honest uh, on the back end. So to me, it's the receivers. I'm going to be on <laughs> the receivers have to step up the season for them to have success. The receivers have to make plays. It's just, there's not been a playmaker on the outside since Neil Brown. So one of those guys got to do it. I know they're looking at DC, uh, Devin Carter, uh, kind of that big body uh, in the red zone, that deep threat uh, down the field. So, and then you kind of within the passing game, not the receiving room, but Cole Taylor. Um, they, uh, you know, we've been hearing about use of tight ends since Dana yeah. uh, took over the program. So, to have somebody in the middle uh, with a big body like that as well, I think Cole Taylor could be that guy. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a receiver, you have someone that can do it from the tight end position. Uh, that can work as well. So one of those one of those transfers have has to step up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Devin Carter's probably that guy on the offensive side, and I, I don't know what to expect from EJ Horton. He didn't have a whole lot of production at Marshall. I know he didn't get a ton of playing time. He dealt with some stuff there, but um, I, I think you also got to rely on some of those guys that are coming back too. Jeremiah, Aaron, 
Cortez Braham. And and Neil Brown talked about it. Like, that's really what's going to be the telling sign of this team is the returning production. Where are those guys at in their development? Can they really help take this next step? And there's two areas that Neil seems to really have his focus on this fall camp, one of which is on the defensive side, the other one's on special teams. Defense, terrible tackling out of the gates last year. I mean, they just could not stop a nosebleed in those first few weeks, especially against Pitt. Kansas was atrociously bad. Uh, And I'm actually quoting Neil Brown there. He even said atrociously bad, too. Um, The tackling was bad, so they have a new plan in place for that. And there's also on special teams, they got to get better starting field position. I think he said they were like average starting at a, their own 21, where teams in the top of the Big 12 are at the 27 or 28. So that's a key focus for the special teams. And I mean, yeah, if you're starting at the 20 yard line, you're, you're essentially taking yourself, you're giving yourself no chance, even when you don't have an offense. So talk about the importance, obviously, of more so the, the, the defensive stuff in, in their plan that they have uh, for fall camp. Yeah, they plan to be more physical than they have in the past. Um, you know, there's there's obviously new NCAA rules that kind of limits them from doing certain things, but they also limited themselves even more. Uh, obviously, there was a con- there's been a concern for depth uh, since COVID, NIL, transfer for all that good stuff, and everything kind of got raided there. Um, there was concern for depth. You also don't want to go in this season banged up the first week right. so there's got to be a healthy balance uh, and that's kind of trying to what they're finding they know they, they've been more physical since the spring uh, and they're really just kind of hoping that pays off and uh, moving forward so we'll see hopefully you know you don't want to go into Penn State you know right off the rip it'd be different if you're playing Duquesne maybe um, but right off the rip you're going into Penn State so they're gonna have to find a healthy balance uh, make sure these guys uh, are ready to go because, again, you don't want those guys obviously teeing off on your offense either. Um, but they, they have enough depth, uh, especially at running back and get a lot of those young guys reps uh, as well. And then obviously your quarterbacks, uh, John Boyle is a big kid. Uh, honestly, he's probably the bigger of, the, of all the quarterbacks right now. And he's a true freshman. So he could probably take uh, a little bit of punishment. Again, you don't want these kids uh, getting blasted. Uh, you don't want C.J. Donaldson getting hurt, um, but you need him to get contact as well. They got to be ready for this, so he can break tackles. So there is, I th- I think that's just one of those areas where you know this isn't a new uh, a new storyline. Coaches have been trying to find this balance. There's been coaches in the past that hit 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 hit. You know it's going to make you tougher. It's going to you know go down the list of all the positives they believe. Um, and then you've seen coaches do that, and they just come through fall camp. There's been a list of injuries, season ending injuries. So they try to limit it. We'll see how that works out. Um, again, it's just, I don't know really how, I mean, it's probably the same thing as I don't know really how much you get better unless you hit. Uh, I know they addressed it last year. They kind of talked about it, like, well, we didn't really have the depth uh, to be able to do that. Now they do. It is young depth. And that actually, you know, with the, with the trust, that's actually a development forward because now you're able to develop your younger guys, retain them. Uh, and they've been through those rough practices to get toughened up. So we'll see how that pays off. But I would say it's probably going to do uh, well for them, hitting a movement target like that instead of hitting the pad. Uh, I know technology's come a long way where they can make those moves. It's not just coaches uh, dragging, them or dragging them around all over the place. So uh, there's you, you, the best way to replicate game action is actually hitting each other. So we'll see how it pays off week one. Yeah, and you mentioned – young running backs. I want to get your take on this before we get out of here. Jaheim White, DJ Oliver, we, we've heard a lot about Rodney Gallagher all off season, and, and now we're hearing about him too, a wide receiver, but the two running backs, DJ Oliver and Jaheim White, Chad Scott is in love with these guys, and rightfully so. I mean, he is in charge of that room, but do you feel like there's any type of way or any role for these two guys, especially considering how crowded that room is. You got C.J. Donaldson in there. Like, you got Jalen Anderson, Justin Johnson, who everyone seems to forget about for some reason. Yet, could they find a way to get a fourth and maybe a fifth guy involved in that room? I mean, that's a lot of of guys to to beat, a lot of mouths to feed. 
Oh yeah, I mean that's dependent on the passing game. Who steps on receivers? You can you can take Jaheim White and probably move him to slot at times. Um, again, he's a freshman or you know trying to find ways to get him the ball, kind of like they did CJ. Uh, maybe not to that scale uh, from last year, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say Chad Scott's ex- is as excited about Jaheim White um, as he was with Jalen Anderson and Justin Johnson Jr. We've seen what they can do. Uh, DJ Oliver is quickly uh, getting getting some reps there in the backfield, um, and you already see him making plays. Again, these are just you know light practices, thud practices, whatever. Uh, see what it's like when he's get hit, but he's he's a tank. Uh, he gets upfield. He's north and south. He's exactly what they said when they recruited him. Um, so yeah, these guys are going to get it. And I think what you can see with you know a kid like CJ Donaldson, you know he started playing as a freshman. Um, now he's got the NIL, everything. A lot of these running backs, you're bringing in these talented freshman running backs. Um, I don't know exactly what the sales pitch is, but you kind of see in the NFL, right? Um, they're a dime a dozen now. Uh, you kind of see running backs that got beat up early on in their career, shortened their career. Um, and you can kind of go back with them when they were in college. They played more likely two, three, four seasons, uh, took the pounding out of college, and it got – you know, obviously much harder in the NFL. So I think when you could bring these young running backs in and say, hey, you're only going to get so many carries, but, you know, save your body, get stronger, get better, watch the game. Uh, I think you can get these kids to buy into that and you don't have to necessarily find ways uh, to get them to get uh, get them the ball, get them the ball to get make keep them happy. Um, I mean, look at Justin Johnson right now. Uh, he's been here for a while. He hasn't been the, the feature guy, but now is this this is his opportunity, especially with Tony Mathis leaving. Uh, these kids' opportunities could happen any moment. C.J. Donaldson didn't finish last year, so having guys like Jaheim White so far down the list uh, is a great problem to have. Yeah. Uh, maybe having to find uh, a play here and you know not tip off the play uh, to get these guys. Guys, the ball is obviously a great problem to have. So they're really set at running back. And when you, you know, I guess before we leave, probably should mention the offensive line, something that really stuck out to me this week uh, is when Neil Brown said, uh, we'd like to find a couple more walk-on offensive linemen. It was just two years ago. They were just trying to find their best five. So what a big jump uh, in two years where you would just want to get some more bodies for the walk-ons. Uh, as offensive linemen, so that that's huge. Um, when you got that front, it looks like they got a nice two deep, good solid group. They're going three. Uh, you know, I know Matt Moore wants four deep, but it looks like they're actually building uh, with younger guys into the three deep. So great problem to have. Uh, running game should be strong. Business decisions. That's what Chad Scott said about DJ Oliver and CJ Donaldson. I love that. <laughs> when I when I hear it, I get all juiced up and I, I get the goosebumps and. It's just – it's fun to hear stuff like that, especially when you got two monster running backs. Actually, let me take that back. They're not monsters. They're refrigerators in the backfield. That's what they are. And it's going to be fun to watch them. I like to see DJ Oliver. You even told me he looks big, in shape, ready to go. Like, he's he's not this 200 – near 40-pound back that's out of shape and it's a bad 240. It's a good, healthy 240 pounds. So – that's that's quite the one-two punch. Obviously, DJ Oliver is probably not going to factor into that into that offense all that much this year. But still, to have that in that in that room, I mean, he could be a red he could be a red zone problem. I mean, if you're looking at CJ, he's only a sophomore. Um, it's a long season. There's no off weeks. Do uh, you still want to pound that defense? DJ Oliver is going to be a part of that offense one way or another. He's not going to get 20 carries. He may not even get five carries a game. But when they get in that red zone, he's going. to Definitely lighten the load for CJ, and that makes a big difference when you can still pound the defense and your star running back doesn't have to continue to take that pounding. Yep. So great problem to have, like you said, and we are out of time officially. So that's going to do it for us here on Between the Ears. Uh, for Christopher Hall, I'm Scott Callen. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Mountaineers Now or X, whatever we call it. I'm still trying to figure that out, by the way. And uh, subscribe to us on YouTube at Mountaineers now as well. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Between the Years.